Hi, my name is Mike Montaigne. I'm the communication coordinator here at the Rock Bible Church. And on behalf of myself and the staff, we want to just thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube page. If you live here in the area, we would love for you to come and stop by and hang out with us on a Sunday morning. Our service times are 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. Now, if you haven't liked and subscribed to our page yet, go ahead and hit that like button, and that way you can get a notification anytime we drop a video. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let the sermon start, and I hope it has blessings upon your life, and God just really speaks to you through the message. You guys have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you around. We are quickly coming to a close. Our church goes verse by verse through a book of the Bible, and we are quickly coming to a close in the study of 2 Thessalonians. There are only 18 verses left, so by my calculation, 18 verses means we should probably finish this book in about six to eight months. Uh, and so, uh, I kid, there's only a few uh, sermons left. And uh, remember, Paul has, there are three themes in this book. We've already covered Two of them, and we were about to cover uh, laziness, idleness inside the church. And, and, and before Paul dives into this last theme, he takes a small detour uh, and uh, uh, addresses um, a concern, uh, um, uh, an issue, uh, something that I believe hits home for pastors, hits home for Christians, uh, because Paul takes a, a, a detour to plead with the church for their support. Though Paul founded this church, though Paul has a calling, he's been anointed from the Lord, Paul knows he is not alone. Paul knows he needs community. Paul knows that the church needs him, but also he needs the church. And I would agree with this. I, I, I feel this, that we are all need each other. See, community hinges upon each and every one of us showing up for one another, uh, finding the balance in how we grow together. Because regardless of how wonderful you think you are, wonderful, regardless of how strong you think you may be, you need people. And people need you. And I think we go through, I think for some of us, we go, and maybe all of us, we go through seasons of like utopia community. You know, when you think of a utopia, everything's perfect and, and, and you're laying on a couch and, and someone's feeding you grapes while the other person's fanning you with a leaf and, and you know, and, and I think we go through seasons of, uh, of utopia inside a community to where we look around and we say, this community needs to serve me. And I don't need to put any work into it. And I think there are seasons that us, we go through to where we kind of get fallen into that trap of just going, okay, this people, this community, you need to meet all of my needs, but I don't need to do any work to meet anyone else's. This is a utopia for me and me alone. And it's, it's difficult. It's it's hard because, because there are seasons in our lives where we're spent, right? Each and every one of us has seasons in our lives to where we just can't give anything else. Seasons in our lives to where we're emotionally, mentally, physically just done. We can't give anything. But then there's other seasons in our lives to where we are riding on the mountaintop to where emotionally everything's great. All of our relationships great. We're physically great. We're spiritually great. And we're sitting on the mountaintops and we're licking and going, life is great right now. And we have a tendency on one end not to be able to give anything. And then on the other end, because things are so great, we're looking around and going, everything's great. Let's just soak in this goodness Instead of looking around going, okay, who's in the valley that I can help get to this mountaintop? And those are both polar opposites of this utopian issue or mindset of community. But I think for most of us, we live right in the middle. 
perfect. We're not everything is perfect. We could, we could use some encouragement, and, and, and not everything is bad, and so we could give some encouragement. But I think most of us live right in the middle to where we, we don't do either because we're just busy. We're just trying to survive the day. And that's where I believe community suffers. Because most of us don't think about, when we're busy, serving one another. Most of us in the midst of busy just think about survival. And if we live in just a survival mode, a, a, <coughs> a, and accomplish our daily task and our daily task uh, only, then we don't help or encourage others or then be encouraged. And then all of us across the board, we all lose because we're all too busy. Maybe this sounds like your life. You go to work. And as soon as you get off of work, you got to go to sports practice to watch your kid not be very good at that sport. Um, you then have to then uh, get home, and now it's homework, and they got to study, and you're sitting here going, I don't know how to do fifth grade math, but I'm going to fake it through to I make it and walk to the bathroom and ask Siri how to do ma math problems, right? Then, then you're trying to make dinner. And after you make dinner, you have to get your kids in bed and you have to get them to brush their teeth. And for us with four girls at home, we just want them to brush their hair. Like, your teeth can fall out. Just brush your hair. Like, you know, like, and then at that point in time, everyone's finally in bed and you can carve out 20 minutes to watch your favorite TV show just to fall asleep on the couch and start the day all over again. I, I believe the Bible means for us to experience more than just that. To actually have true community, not just be busy all the time. And community takes genuine effort from all people to actually put in the work. And when you actually put in the work and you get involved in other people's lives, you experience and you reap a massive reward. When people start to see your flaws, when you start to see their flaws and you love them through it, I read this quote and love this quote, community is when you learn, I'm not everything you thought I was. And I learn, you're not everything I thought you were. And of course, we all can't be in deep community with everyone. You, you can't be in deep community, deep relationship with everyone in this room. But church, you need to hear me. Though you can't be in deep community with everyone, you do need to be in deep community with someone. That everyone in this church should be in deep relationship, deep community, learning their yuck and loving them through that. And then on top of that, each and every one of us, though we can't be in deep relationship with everyone, and I can't be in deep relationship with all of y'all, from time to time, I can, as Scripture says, spur you on to love and good works as we look to the day that Jesus returns, Hebrews chapter 10. And so with that, we need to know, and Paul's point here is that each and every one of us needs help. That I need your help. You need my help. We need each other's help. We need to be in community. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at just five verses today. First, uh, Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 for this moment. <coughs> it says this. Finally... Pray for us, brothers and sisters, that the Lord's message may spread quickly and be honored as, uh, as in fact it was among you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and evil people, for not all have faith. Pause real quick. Um, I think these are interesting. So Paul, as you know in this thing, he planted this church and then was ran out of town for fear of his life. He left, and now he's in Corinth. Um, it's kind of interesting to think, though, uh, that these letters were written as he's in Corinth and he's establishing and preaching the gospel in Corinth right now that then we would know years later he would write First and Second Corinthians to. So it's kind of neat to see God moving and he's begging for this church to help him plant this church that we get to read all four letters to both churches and we get to grow from it. And, and I find it interesting in here because as he's at this massive city, 
he could have asked for anything. He could ask for more volunteers. He could ask more, for more preachers. He's like, I'm at this massive city. I need more workers. I need more volunteers. I need people to help me advance the gospel. Uh, he could have asked for a private jet. He could have. Some preachers do. Uh, and, I mean, he could have sat here and goes like, hey, listen, there's this city called Rome that I need to go preach the gospel to. Not to mention I'm hearing about this, this place called China that I probably should go to and Africa and all of these other things. I need a jet so that I can advance the gospel further. But he didn't do that. He didn't ask for more volunteers. He didn't ask for private jets. He asked for the church to pray. He called. He begged for the church to pray. First thing I uh, want you to get today is there is power and importance in prayer, church. See that when a community begins to pray, when a gathering of believers cry out to the Lord, our God does supernatural things. Not just a gathering of believers. Man, when just a saint, when a believer cries out to the Lord. The cool thing about it, the, the amazing thing about it is God hears the prayers of an even one saint. Church, there is importance. There is power behind our prayers. Paul already encouraged this church in 1 Thessalonians 5 to pray without ceasing. See, we need to see the importance and power comes from an understanding that every aspect, every step Every moment of your life needs to be dependent upon God. Much like Paul asked this church, I now ask of you. Church, I need your prayers. I need your prayers. I need you to be praying daily for your pastor, praying for me that, that God would remind me, that God would, would keep me depended upon him. As we grow this faith community, as we reach the community of Clay County, I would ask, would you be praying that God would keep me holy in my relationships at home? Keep me holy in my financial life? Keep me holy when I drive down Blanding Boulevard? Would you just, would you pray and pray that God would keep me dependent upon him and also give me the boldness to proclaim the gospel. This Greek phrasing for pray for us means literally make it a common pattern. Church, would you make it a common pattern to be constantly thinking and praying for me? Praying for me to be dependent on the Lord and praying for me to be bold in proclaiming the, the, the faith? Because here's what I truly believe. If you actively made it common to be praying for me to be dependent on the Lord, and you're constantly thinking about being dependent upon the Lord, you will then start being dependent upon the Lord. As you are praying for me to be bold in my faith, you will be thinking about being bold in the faith, and then you will be bold in the faith. See, when we pray for one another, as I pray for you and as you pray for me, all of us grow. All of us are built up in the gospel. And so Paul tells the church to pray that the Lord's message would spread quickly. This Greek imagery is a, a runner who is running as fast as he can and actually gaining ground. And so what Paul is saying here is that every city, every town he comes to, he wants that to be filled with the gospel, to see it transformed. And that's the vision here. We want to preach the whole gospel through the whole church to make whole people, to impact our whole community and reach our whole world. We don't want to reach just some of this. The 400 people that come to here on a Sunday morning isn't just who we want to reach. We want to reach every aspect of Clay County, every person of Clay County. And so Paul encourages the church to pray because he knows obstacles are going to try to get in his way. He says in this passage uh, that they may be delivered from perverse and evil people. One commentary said this in the Greek about this word perverse. It literally means people who are out of place. It denotes what is unbecoming or inappropriate. It means people who are improper 
wrongfully out of place or unrighteous. The writer goes on to describe these people as morally insane. So he calls people who are not of the faith morally insane in their corrupt desires for the things of this, this world. And he could have just stopped with morally insane. But the passage actually goes on and he calls these people evil. This, this word evil literally means aggressively wicked. So Paul is calling these people morally insane and aggressively wicked. Anyone else watch the news and go, man, these people are crazy and really wicked. Church, I think for us, as we live in a world where not, as this passage says, not all people are of the faith, the church more, the, almost more than ever needs to be uh, focused and find the importance and power in our prayers. And for some of you, you may be sitting here going, well, pastor, my prayers just aren't fancy, and that's okay. I don't care if you have fancy prayers. I just want you to have often prayers. I'm going to say that again. I don't care how fancy your prayers are. I just long for you to have often prayers, to constantly be praying. I covet your prayers. We covet your prayers. My staff covets your prayers. The elders, the deacons, we need your prayers. Really, everyone in this faith community needs to be praying for each other. Being at this altar and praying over people and praying with people, begging to be moved by God and begging for God to move. There is power and importance in our prayers. Pick up in verse three and look what he goes on to say. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. To have strong and powerful prayers, believers need to know and understand who they are praying to. Prayers fall on weak knees when believers lack a proper understanding of how mighty and strong our God is. Paul tells T uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, listen to this. At my first events, no one appeared to my support. Instead, they all delivered me. He lacked community in this church. May they not be held accountable for it. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that though that through me the message would fully be proclaimed to all the Gentiles to hear. And so I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord uh, will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely into his heavenly uh, kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, there is power and, and importance in our prayers. But number two, there is power and importance in trusting God. Paul reminds this church in verse 3 that God is faithful and to put their trust in him. That there are benefits from putting their trust in him. He says he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. God is empowering you. And day in and day out, as you put your trust in you, he is empowering you. He is strengthening you. He is renewing for you day in and day out. But on top of strengthening you, he also protects you. And I love the whole Old Testament. And because if you read all throughout the Old Old Testament and the Proverbs and the, the Psalms and really every single story, the main theme in this is that our God is a strong tower. Our God is someone to run to. Our God will protect and defend. <coughs> One of my favorite verses is Proverbs 18.10 that says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. It's a verse that settles my heart time and time again. And I don't know why, but every time I think of that verse, I always think of getting caught in the rain. But not just getting caught in the rain, getting caught in the rain on a boat. Anyone else ever been caught in the rain on a boat or on a jet ski? And, and, and like, when, when, when you're not caught on the rain on a boat, like, and it's just raining, and you're just like, oh, this is magical. We can dance in the rain. This is wonderful. But when you get caught in the rain on the boat, like, those soft little water pellets become violent daggers, right? And as you're trying to drive back, you're being pelted with it. And I, and I remember our, our children at the beginning of the summer, um, it was the first time they ever got caught in the rain um, on a boat. And we were, my dad was trying to get us back. And, um, and uh, I think it was Meta or London, um, uh, and maybe you can cor correct me afterwards, um, but London was at the front of the boat and uh, she was in tears because the... Uh, because the rain was hurting so bad. And she's like, Dad, it just stings. And, and, and I just remember 
um, just like pulling her close and laying on top of her as I'm just getting pelted by these rains drops and, and, and taking the full, the full force of all of these stings so that my child can be protected. We finally got our three-year-old out of the bed. Praise God. Uh, um, but the last two nights, she's been having a nightmare. Meadow is our three-year-old. And, um, and so uh, two nights ago, uh, not last night, the night before. Last night, she got into the bed, and I kicked both of y'all out. Uh, <coughs> but last night, or two nights ago, she got into the bed, um, and you said deuces, and you left. Uh, I don't know where you went, but you slept somewhere. Uh, and um, <laughs> and she, the, the, the nightmare kept happening. And I could, uh, I, and so she would toss and turn, and it wouldn't be a full screen. It'd just be, the, you know, a little kid just like, uh, all night. Um, I noticed that as she tossed and turned, if I late rolled over and I just placed my hand on her chest, she'd stop. But then the moment I would roll back over, she'd start to squirm and the nightmare would come back. And so the rest of the night, I just slept with my hand on her chest. Church, you need to be reminded that our God is faithful. You need to be reminded that our God will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. That our God will pull you in close and take the full brunt of the sting on your behalf. And our God will rest his hand on you in the midst of a storm. There is power and there is importance in remembering and trusting our God, church. Look at the rest of the verse. He says this, and we are confident about you and the Lord that you are (coughs) both doing and will do what you are what we uh, what we are commanding. Third one I want you to get is this: there is power and importance in remaining faithful. See, community thrives. Church churches thrive when the church, when the community rallies around a common vision. And so what Paul was doing was encouraging this church to stay the course, encouraging the church to steady their hearts and uh, follow after Jesus. And I don't know about you, but my heart is steadied when I hear stories of people's faithfulness in seasons of distress and difficulties. April will be nine years I've been the pastor here. I started when I was 28. I had no clue what I was doing. In year one, um, one of our elders' wives uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And it was bad. And I had no clue how to even lead her through that. In that first year, I feel like she did more pastoring of me than I did of her. To watch her come week after week, having probably just thrown up that morning and still coming as her hair fell out and her body became frail as it fought a disease. I remember one time sitting in a, in a, a, a waiting room at a hospital downtown as she was going for a, um, a, a massive reconstructive surgery and removals and all of those things. And 28, 29 years old, and I have no clue how to even talk to the elder, talk to, to, to my buddy, talk to the husband about this. And, and I just remember, I remember the, what, what we've coined the God, the Godfidence, the God confidence that he had just knowing that God would work in a mighty major way. See, church, when we choose to allow a sickness to make us bitter and not better, you're robbing yourself from a God-sized blessing, but you're also robbing the community from witnessing the power of God through your faithfulness. When you go through any storm, and you decide to check out instead of press in, this community suffers. 
But it means it's on both sides. When God calls for you to press into a person who's suffering, to press into those who are hurting, to be there when they need you, and instead of being there, you check out instead of press in, this community suffers. I remember five years ago, a pastor, a friend of mine tried to take his life. I remember having a conversation. Praise the Lord, he failed at the attempt. And I remember having conversations with him because he suffered, suffered massive depression. And the massive depression led to a suicide attempt. And so I remember having a conversation with him as, um, as he was kind of walking through what does it mean to be a pastor who suffers with depression, like severe depression. And um, how do you be a person that people look up to when you hate yourself? And, and he said this, and I look back on it this week, and it, and, and it said this, depression is by far the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life. It's the darkest and most miserable time you can imagine. There's no hope for change. Nothing lifts your spirit at all. Not food, family, or hobbies. Nothing brings you joy. The worst part is you're absolutely convinced this is how life will always be, which then leads to suicidal thoughts because there's no way you can continue in life if this is what you're facing every day. I was rocked by this, and I asked him, that what, 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 could, what could we do, people who are not in this depression, what can they do to help? His response Never say, let me know if you need anything. Someone in the grips of depression will never reach out for help. I encourage you, just show up. I can't say this enough. Over three years, I battled deep depression and suicidal thoughts, and I probably had 100 plus people <coughs> say to me, just let me know if you need anything. They all meant well, but I only had two people ever just show up and sit with me. Those two experiences were game changers in my spiritual growth. Church community is hard. It takes a lot of work, and it takes both sides. It takes those, uh, both sides to remain faithful. It takes those who are struggling to speak up but it also takes those who are on the other end to just show up and to give and to be. We all need help from time to time. And we all need to be looking for someone to pour into and push into time after time. Our job is to be more like Christ. As I begin to close, I want to read a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says this, <clears throat> he, being Jesus, works in all sorts of ways. But above all, he works through each other. Men are mirrors or carriers of Christ to other men. Usually it is those who know him that bring him to others. This is why the church, the whole body, you and I, the whole body of Christianity, showing uh, him to one another is so important. It's easy to think that the church has a lot of different objects, education and buildings and missions and holding services. The church exists for no other purpose but to draw men and women unto Christ. To make them little Christ. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, all the clergy, all the missions, all the sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose but to draw people unto himself. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose than to draw people unto Christ. Our job, church, is to draw people to Christ. Our job is to help other people uh, be drawn to Christ, to have deep Rich community is vital for long-term growth. 
uh, my biggest prayer <coughs> in the month of November, I take my, my sabbatical. I get, a, I get a sabbatical every seven years. In the eighth year, I get a sabbatical. And so I'm taking it in November. We'll, the elders will talk more about that uh, in weeks to come. Um, but the, the biggest thing I'm praying through the next three plus years of our church is I'm praying three words. May our church be healthy in every relationship. For you to be healthy in all of your relationships. Every relationship you come in contact, because you're a healthy person, your relationships are healthy. That you're holy. That because you're a healthy person in Christ, you then have a desire to be righteous because our God is righteous. To be holy because our God is holy. And to be high impact. That we be a church that impacts not just a small portion, but all of Clay County because our people are healthy, our people are holy, and our people live and pursue Christ. This is the prayer that I pray because I believe if we are healthy, we are holy, we are high impact, we meet our vision where the whole church becomes whole people. As I conclude with the last verse, Paul says this, Now may the Lord direct your hearts towards the love of God and the endurance of Christ. Point number four, (coughs) there is power and importance in spiritual growth. See, Paul concludes this little community detour uh, with this word, pushing and pressing them into spiritual growth. He uses this word direct. Now may the Lord direct your hearts. That Greek word is uh, katanathos. I butchered it, but that's okay. You didn't know that. Uh, um, the, 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 that Greek word literally means to remove all obstacles, to not be hindered, to make straight a path. Paul is saying here, now may the Lord remove all obstacles in your hearts so that you can get to the love of God. Paul says here, may the Lord not hinder you or your hearts towards the love of God. May the, may the Lord make straight all your paths to get to the love of our God. I got fired from a church in Atlanta. Oh, our pastor got fired? Yeah, I did. Uh, um, our pastor was stealing money, and I said, hey, you probably shouldn't steal money. That's not a, that's not a good thing to do, and I got fired. Crazy, I know. Uh, true story. Uh, and we were young. I was 24, you were 22, I think it was. Um, and our pastor, he was, he was a biker guy. He, he's, he was like six, seven. He was 300 something pounds. He was rough around the edges. And, um, and I was, again, 24. And I stood up and I said, hey, listen, you can't, you can't steal money. Um, and then we get fired and we get harassed. I'm getting calls at two o'clock in the morning for the pastor's wife cursing me out and hanging up. We're afraid of going to the grocery store because we may run into them. And he's huge. He had hands. <laughs> just, just, was, you know, and it just, and it just, and it got to a place and it got to a point um, where my dad just showed up. Just got a U-Haul. Said, my kid's coming home. Drove from Jacksonville to Atlanta and said, you're coming home. We packed it up and the the night we left, I got my life first tattooed on my arm. Philippians 1.6. God is the one who began this good work. And I am certain that he will be will carry it on to completion to the day in which Jesus returns. See, church, no obstacle should hinder us from growing in Christ. Because in the middle of a valley, in the difficulty and the hard time, remember, our God is the God who began this good work. When you are on the the mountaintop and you're looking around and going, look how great I am. May you be reminded that our God is the one who began a good work. 
it humbles and it encourages all at the same time, church. I don't know what you're going through and I don't know where you're at, but here's the things I know. You need community and you need deep understanding of the things of God. Two things for spiritual growth in Christians. One, you need to believe and follow all the teachings of Christ. Second thing, you need to live with the consequences that come from that. Healthy, holy, high impact. Community is vital. Your spiritual growth is vital. Prayer, remaining faithful, trusting God. These are all important parts of, uh, of community. And these are all important parts of <coughs> surviving this crazy world. Because it's kind of hard out there. And so, as we conclude, and my time is up, this altar will be open, and I don't know what you need. If you need to pray, and you need to believe, and have God restore something in your hearts. Or, actually, no or. This is what I'm going to call for us to do. As you're praying, as you're worshiping, I want everyone in this room to find someone that you can shake their hands today. I'm a fist bump. Say, hey, my name is so-and-so. You are what? Because we got to foster community. Everyone in this church that can hear my voice, I am asking you today, as you awkwardly look around at people singing and go, that person can't sing. Yeah, that's, then maybe that's the person that you need to sit here and go, that's who I'm going to shake their hands today. Um, you may be someone that you haven't seen in a long time, maybe someone brand new. It doesn't matter. Everyone is responsible. And if you leave today and you walk away and go, well, this church isn't friendly. No one shook my hand. No, nope, you were supposed to shake someone's hand. We're not friendly. You're not friendly. Uh, and, the, and so everyone has a responsibility. And if everyone looks around to shaking somebody's hand today and you go to shake someone's hand today or say hello or ask them the name, then everyone should get their name asked or everyone should shake someone's hand. And we should be in deep community. And here's why. And I do not have the time to share this story. Um, I don't do it anyways. Um, when you leave today and you see the 1130 service, shake their hand as you pass them. Um, I told this in the first service because um, uh, Chris was in the back exactly where he was and I made an off color joke that all of you matter and every one of you matters because all of you are in a seat and every seat is a person and every person matters to Jesus except for Chris. He's not in a seat right now and I said, Chris, you matter. And so then Chris awkwardly tried to sit down on the floor and which things you don't know about, Chris, is like you think Tyler and Courtney are hippie. Uh, I believe it's a boy. Uh, and like, <laughs> they are. And um, it was six, five, six years ago. Um, we didn't know this. Uh, we look back on it now. I hired Chris to play drums for us. Um, just one random Sunday, we, we called a company and said, we need a drummer. And they sent Chris. And he, didn't, he wasn't married to Natalie yet and all of those different things. And the church was flipped. We weren't even remodeled. For some of you, you remember this. Like, I preached over there. None of this existed. Uh, and there were pews and it was full. And that hipster uh, looked around after he got done playing and um, I'm there looking this way and he's probably right about here. Um, and instead of asking some to scoot over, he just awkwardly got into uh, Indian style and sat in the middle of the floor. And I'm looking down the aisle preaching, and I'm watching this crazy hipster dude sit on the floor. And I'm like, what is this weirdo doing as I'm preaching? Is he sitting on the floor? And, uh, and, and so the day ended, and I'm like, that guy was nuts, and he left his Bible. And so we had to come get it the next day. And so we ended up talking for like an hour as he picked up his Bible. And I remember programming him into my phone, uh, Chris Drummer, possible church planner. Like that's how I programmed. I didn't even know his last name at the time. Uh, two plus years, three years go by. And I'm going through my phone going, well, I got I to gotta delete some of these names. So I deleted his number. <laughs> I was like, I'm never going to talk to this guy again. I'm going to delete his number. Um, and then two weeks later, I think it was maybe three weeks later, I get his resume to apply for a job here. 
It's like, I just deleted this guy's number and now I'm gonna hire this guy. Why do I say all of that? If you were to tell me six, seven years ago, the crazy hipster dude that sat in the middle of my floor while I was preaching would one day be a massive influence in my spiritual life to push me closer to Jesus on a regular basis, I would have looked at you and said, you're nuts. And so church, you may hear your pastor go, I'm gonna shake someone's hand today. You have no clue, because I had no clue, that that handshake now, seven years from now, may blossom such deep, rich community because we have nothing in common except for Jesus <laughs> at all. And, but there is such deep, rich community in the sheer fact that both of us love the Lord and both of us love the church. So yeah, you're going to awkwardly shake someone's hand today. And I truly believe God is going to use it because community matters, church. Let me pray for us.